Tonight, our guest is Dr. Thomas Reed, uh, who is currently the chief of the Division of Gastrointestinal Surgery at the University of Florida College of Medicine. He received his bachelor's at Harvard and medical doctorate from the University of California, San Francisco, and he did his residency in general surgery and also his basic science research fellowship there. He completed his uh, colorectal fellowship at Leahy Clinic. Um, and he, of course, has accomplishments and accolades that are too numerous to name. But importantly, he served in a variety of leadership positions, including former president of the American Society of College and Rectal Surgeons, Colon and Rectal Surgeons, excuse me, president of the American Board of Colon and Rectal Surgery and governor uh, to the American College of Surgeons. Um, and we are very grateful to have him here tonight talking about diverticulitis and COSMID. So thank you, Dr. Reed, for being here. Um, if anybody has any questions, you can submit those through the chat um, in the Zoom or through Sir John. Either one is fine, and we'll kind of collate those and uh, shoot those at Dr. Reed. So with that, we'll have you take it away. Well, thanks very much, Gabby, and uh, welcome all of you tonight out there in Zoom and Sir John land. Um, for those of you who know me, you know I'm big on interaction. I just gave a lecture in Dallas on Friday, and I usually bring a bag of candy and have questions for the audience and show pictures of fish. Now, we can't do that tonight, but if you have if you have questions, just uh, fire them in and Gabby will process them and interrupt me if it's appropriate. So um, Gabby asked me to talk about diverticulitis and this is a disease that's near and dear to my heart. I've had it, my, people in my family have had it. My sister got operated on emergently for it at Leahy Clinic when I was a senior resident in general surgery at UCSF. And unfortunately, despite the prevalence of the disease, there is a lot of dogma. Um, and up until recently, more dogma than data. So what I'd like to do, challenge you a little bit and see if we can work through what's dogma and what is supported by data. So some disclosures, I serve as the chair of the clinical advisory group for the COSMIC trial, which we'll talk about later. This is a funded trial from PCORI. So what are we going to do? Let's talk about making the diagnosis. Um, who needs a colonoscopy? The pathophysiology of the disease? Something about medical treatment? And who needs it collectively and what to do? So this is the case you might get called up about tonight. If you're on call, lady with some abdominal pain, fever, tachycardia, she's a little tender. What happens next? Well, probably before you even get called, you get a CAT scan that looks like this. And um, at this point, the radiologist tells the ER doc that this is diverticulitis and they should call the colorectal surgery team. So I would encourage you all to remember, although that's probably the most common thing that would cause that picture, segmental inflammation of the colon or the pericolonic tissue can also be caused by these other four things. And uh, so figuring that out um, really depends on a good history. And the most important question to ask is, have they had their colon evaluated either by colonoscopy or contrast enema or CT telegraphy? And when that evaluation was and what did it show? Uh, because these are CAT scans of patients I've been asked to see who had previously been given a diagnosis of diverticulitis, who had other things. This person had ischemic colitis. This was Crohn's. This was a perforated cancer. This is the one you don't want to sit on. And unfortunately, we get referred to us probably about three or four patients a year who've been told they had diverticulitis who actually have a perforated cancer. And obviously that delays their definitive treatment. So these are two of my former labs, uh, Lexi and Zoe. Uh, so I love dogs, don't like the dogma. And so the first piece of dogma we've gone after is CT make the diagnosis. So then the next question is, well, okay, so we're not sure taking a history uh, whether they have cancer or whether it's just diverticulitis, who should we do a colonoscopy on? And so there have been a bunch of folks who uh, put out clinical practice guidelines, et cetera, um, that say a variety of things. The data are not crystal clear on who needs what. Um, so if we look at the rate of finding cancer or advanced neoplasia, which means a polyp greater than a centimeter or any villus architecture, we can see that in patients uh, undergoing colonoscopy after presumed diverticulitis, their rate of cancer was 2% and advanced neoplasia was 7%. And 
Some people said, well, that means you don't need a colonoscopy, although if you compare that rate to the cancer rate for routine screening colonoscopy, it, it looks fairly generous. And so I would argue against that um, recommendation. Uh, there is some bias in many of the studies as they don't exclude people who have had screening prior to their episode of diverticulitis. So obviously, if Peter Marcello does a good quality colonoscopy the week before, and you show up with diverticulitis in the ER, it's probably not a cancer. So again, this is an individualized decision. Obviously, they're the patient's personal and family history, history of prior colonoscopy, whether their symptoms resolve or are persistent. So what I've found over the years is that people with perforated cancer never really get better. They'll get a little bit better when you throw antibiotics on them, but they will look more like the case of smoldering diverticulitis. And those are the people who should tip you off. You should probably look in their colon sooner rather than later. All right, so we've addressed making the diagnosis and who to do a colonoscopy on. And I would say when to do a colonoscopy really depends on how the patient's doing. If all their symptoms resolve, it's probably reasonable to do a colonoscopy at that time. Is that three weeks, four weeks, six weeks, eight weeks? I don't think there's prospective randomized data that could guide us. Um, and there are some patients who just never get better and you have to make a decision on whether you're going to put a scope in and blow up their colon with gas because you just got to know whether they have cancer or not, because if that will change what you do. All right. How about pathophysiology? Things are changing, but when I trained, when I was in your shoes, which was long ago, everyone thought that diverticulitis was due to nuts and seeds. And I still hear that from the medical students today. They taught that in their basic pathophysiology courses in med school. And in fact, when I was in high school, I worked, and one of my jobs was working in an office, in a dermatology office, and the dermatologist took me to drag his uh, liquid nitrogen bottle around to the hospital and nursing homes to zap people with skin lesions. And he wandered into the OR one day with me, and this is 1978. Most of you were just a gleam in someone's eye at that point. And the first case I ever saw in the operating room was on that visit, and they were doing a case of diverticulitis in a big, huge guy with a big, huge colon. And the first thing they said was this was due to watermelon seeds. So that's hard to disprove. It essentially came from nowhere. Um, the other thing you'll hear from students in medicine is that it is an infection of a diverticulum. I think we can pretty definitively say that is not the case. It is simply a hole in the colon. It's a perforation of a diverticulum. These are little weak areas in between the tinea where the blood vessels come in, so they're doubly weak. They usually line up in between the tinea, so you can see on the scope there's lines of them. And the inflammation is outside the colon. So I tell the students, it's like having a sewer pipe in your living room rug, under your living room rug. If the sewer pipe perforates, the inside of the sewer pipe cares not that there's a hole in the pipe. The living room, however, cares deeply, and you would not invite your neighbors over for a cup of coffee. So um, despite this, uh, there's a lot of uh, misinformation. A lot of textbooks still describe seeds and nuts. I've had people break down and cry in my office because they haven't had a strawberry in 40 years and they love strawberries. Um, I think the best study on this, and I will admit this is hard to study because I can't remember what I ate yesterday, uh, but there was a study from JAMA in 2008, you should pull it up. It was a health professional's longitudinal study over many, many years, almost 50,000 people, and they had to keep food diaries. And when they did the correlations, there was no evidence that what you put in your mouth today or yesterday causes diverticulitis today or tomorrow. And there's no evidence that altering your diet will prevent diverticulitis. And it seemed that people who ate a lot of popcorn seemed to have fewer episodes of diverticulitis. Obviously, association does not equal causation, but as far as I know, there are zero pieces of evidence to support the nuts and seeds theory. What is interesting is that diverticulitis is seasonal. In America, this occurs in the summer months. And the nuts and seeds people will say, well, that's because you're eating all the vegetables and, and fruit. 
Um, my partner, Rocco Ricciardi, when I was at Leahy, had an interest in this, and he used a database uh, demonstrating this. Um, it's fascinating. Other people have shown the same thing for appendicitis. So it may be due to something happening in the gut wall or immune system. Um, some people, uh, Lily McGuire, uh, who I believe now is at Penn, uh, reported this um, and hypothesized that it may be a vitamin D issue. So diverticulitis has been increasing in incidence. If you look at the nationwide inpatient sample, which is this huge database of 20% of all admissions to U.S. hospitals, we can see that it's going up and up and up. Here's more data from Rocco using that database, showing that it was increasing over this 15-year period. So despite the fact it's getting more prevalent, we really don't know what causes it. Why do these things perforate? So that's up to you guys to figure out. And if you could figure it out, wouldn't that be great? I will acknowledge that there does appear to be a group of people who seem to have familial severe diverticulitis. I remember when I was in Boston, Peter Marcello and I operated on a number of uh, siblings in a family. I think there were nine kids and we might have operated on six of them before they turned 50. And I don't know whether this is an elastase gene coding problem or what, but there seems to be a familial diverticulitis phenomenon in a small group of people. All right, so that was that dogma, we'll move on. So the patient comes in, they've had their CAT scan, they call you, you don't think they need to go to the OR, what do you do? So let's talk about acute treatment first. So I would guess that most of you throw antibiotics at them, tell them not to eat anything, and when they start eating, you tell them to go on to go on a low fiber diet, don't touch fiber, stay away from fiber for exactly 13 days and 23 hours. And then once that 14 day mark comes along, you tell them to go down to the grocery store and buy all the Metamucil they have and start eating. So I'm gonna tell you now that that's not really supported by a lot of data. Unfortunately for the United States, a lot of the prospective randomized trials of antibiotics are not for uncomplicated acute diverticulitis were done in Northern Europe. I'll just pull a, a share a couple of them here with you. This was the AVOD trial done in Sweden. Uh, prospective randomized trial, a good number of patients that had to have CT documentation, which is important, excluded folks with more complicated disease, and they admitted everyone and they got IV antibiotics or fluids alone. And as you can see here, there was no difference in outcomes, no difference in pain, temperature, tenderness. At 11-year follow-up, there was no difference in recurrence. So if a patient's not that sick, it doesn't appear to make a difference whether you give them antibiotics. This is another trial from Northern Europe. This is in the Netherlands. Um, this was a similar trial, almost the same number of patients. Again, CT documentation, antibiotics versus observation. And they showed really no difference. This is presented in a different way. The um, blue is you needed an emergency resection over time. Red is elective resection was chosen and complicated recurrence is in green. And you can see that there's not a huge difference between the groups. The vast uh, majority of people had no problem. So if we look at a meta-analysis done by Heather Yeo and colleagues, um, there was no statistically different outcomes for antibiotic treatment uh, or observation. And people always, patients always tell me, well, you know, I go to see Dr. Jones and every time I see Dr. Jones, she gives me antibiotics and every time I get better. And um, I then say, well, if I stand on my left foot and hum, and hum, and, uh, hum the uh, Star Spangled Banner right now in clinic at 10 o'clock tonight, it's going to get dark. And it's not because I did that. So it's likely that your body, which is an amazing biological machine, figures out a way to get you through it uh, without needing antibiotics. And there's a downside to antibiotics. So what do I tell my patients? I tell them that they have systemic signs of illness, fever or tachycardia. I think it's reasonable to treat systemically with antibiotics, but I have no data to support that. Um, and all the data would be, that we have would suggest that people probably don't need it. Your body will control it. Well, what about people with chronic disease? So let's sort of tick down the list here of what people are told to do. 
So when I trained, everything was fiber. You got hit by a bus, you got fluid and fiber. You had diverticulitis, no fiber, then high fiber. Everything was fiber. Turns out there's not a lot of good data to support the use of fiber for a lot of GI illnesses. Um, if it helps your patients have easy bowel movements, go for it. It's not going to hurt them. But it's not a lot of science uh, for preventing diverticulitis or treating it. 5-ASA products have been tried. There have been a number of small studies published. Um, some of them have been randomized. It's hard to know what to make of the data. Um, some say they found the difference in favor of the study drug and others not. The Faximin is an expensive drug. Um, there have been another, a bunch of studies looking at Rifaximin. And here is the you know, circular logic here. There are studies showing that Rifaximin is better than fiber. Mesalamine is better than Rifaximin, but Mesalamine is no better than placebo. So A is greater than B is greater than C is greater than A. So I don't really know what to make of it. Probiotics have been um, written about a lot. Uh, not a lot of high quality data. They're kind of like the new bottled water, right? Everyone should be on probiotics and they're really expensive, um, but not a lot of data to support their use. Remember that there's, uh, when you look at the Venn diagram for diverticulitis and IBS, there's about a 25% overlap in folks, at least who undergo colectomy. And uh, so it's really hard to know whether a patient's symptoms are due to diverticulitis or IBS. And Liliana Bordnau at Mass General published a study, I want to say 15 years ago, showing that 25% of their patients who had good resections for diverticulitis had persistence of the symptoms that pushed them to have the colectomy, probably suggesting that a lot of their symptoms were IBS related. So now, if we talk about dogma for medical treatment, uh, we just discussed that antibiotics for uncomplicated diverticulitis in the absence of systemic symptoms, uh, not supported by data, neither is fiber, diet, drugs, or probiotics. So then patients always ask me, well, what, what, what should I do, doc? And I tell them, well, I do sort of do things that make sense to me, although not supported by data. If I have diverticulitis, I think of my colon as a sewer pipe. And the first thing you do if you had a busted sewer pipe underneath your house is turn off the flow of sewage to that pipe. So I try to limit the amount of poop I make by stop eating solid food and live on Ensure and clear liquids until I start feeling better. Um, I don't tell anything, anyone anything about fiber other than if you eat a lot of fiber, it could increase your stool bulk and maybe that is good for the colon or maybe it's bad for the colon and we don't know. I do not normally prescribe probiotics or rifaximin or 5-ASA to people unless they demand it as part of the COSMIC trial, which we'll talk about. So now into the meat of the talk, uh, what you're here to discuss is who needs a colectomy. So we'll talk about the natural history of the disease, which was misunderstood for years, staging systems, and can they help us? And what do you do with the patient who walks into your office selectively with what we call quality of life limiting disease, either recurrent attacks that are uncomplicated or smoldering disease. So we sort of break it down like this, um, uncomplicated, healthy people over the age of 50, and then these subcategories of young immunocompromised and smoldering, and then we'll talk about complicated. So in the first group, uh, the good old days when I trained uh, and our uh, clinical practice guidelines from those times mandated that if you had two attacks over the age of 50, you should uh, have a colectomy. One attack under the age of 50, colectomy. History of abscess, colectomy. You were in, awaiting an organ transplant. And back in those days, livers just came out in the 80s. So we saw people in just the kidney transplant days and the kidney transplant people would tell us we should operate if they had diverticulosis on their pre-transplant colonoscopy. That bought them a collection. They came into the ER and they had air or pus in their peritoneal cavity. Everyone needed a collection. It's a great day to be a surgeon. However, none of this was based on data. If you ask the 30,000 foot view question, what happens, so, what happens after an episode of diverticulitis? Usually not much. Uh, usually your worst is your first. Um, recurrent episodes are usually uncomplicated, and subsequent episodes with free perforation or ruptured abscess are rare. 
So how do we know that? Well, starting in the 90s, I would say, uh, there have been a number of studies looking at big databases. This is um, Mahar Abbas's work from Kaiser. Uh, they had a big healthcare system and patients didn't move much. So they had a there were more than 2,000 patients in this observational trial, and you can see after an episode of diverticulitis, the recurrent rate was very small. This is Dave Flum's work. Uh, he's at the University of Washington. He queried their state database, uh, 25,000 uh, patients, 20,000 of which were treated non-operatively at initial presentation, so most patients weren't rushed to the OR. And at five years, they had a 19% recurrence rate and 5% emergency colectomy rate. The problems with all these data are we don't really have a handle when we look retrospectively on what defines an attack. Um, if you wander into your PCP's office and say, you know, Dr. Smith, I've got this pain, I've got diverticulitis, will you write me a prescription for antibiotics? Dr. Smith can talk to you for half an hour, put you through some tests, et cetera. Um, and talk to you about the data showing antibiotics are not needed, even if you did have an attack, or she could just give you the script you want and code, check off the box on the CPT code that says diverticulitis or the DRG code, and then it gets coded as diverticulitis, and maybe it was just IBS. There have been some groups, including uh, our group at Leahy, this was led by Jason Hall and Rocco Ricciardi, uh, they created a database of people who had CT confirmation of segmental inflammation or pericolonic inflammation with colon. They had about a thousand patients like this who were not operated on initially. And um, these were confirmed by a select group of excellent radiologists. And uh, they followed 700 of them who were where it was their first episode. And here you can see their recurrent rate, recurrent rate. So notice that this group had a recurrent rate that was a little bit higher. So a third of them had a recurrent episode in five years. That's a little more than Kaiser in the Washington State database. And I wonder it's because what that they mandated that they had to have CT confirmation of disease. So this was either a more severe group or some of the patients in the other studies didn't really have diverticulitis. But again, when they looked at complicated recurrent diverticulitis, those rate, rates were really low. So I have heard surgeons in my training tell patients, listen, Mrs. Jones, you don't wanna wait. The next one could be the big one. You can be in the ICU with an open abdomen and have a colostomy um, and push them to have surgery. And that's really not supported by data at all. Well, what about the young? So I think there is some truth to the slightly higher rate of recurrent in young folks. This is sort of the Kaiser data. You could see the curves diverged a little bit, over 50, under 50. In the Washington State database, they plums study again, the curves diverge. So if you get it early, maybe it's a little bit different of a disease, but the rate of emergency surgery does not appear to be hugely different. Um, the same observation was seen in our database. If you're young and got diverticulitis, the course was a little bit worse. So what about immunocompromised patients? I know some of you have been called by transplant doctors, just like I was, um, saying, listen, uh, I have someone who's had a liver transplant. They're on immunosuppressants. They've had diverticulitis, and you need to operate on them. And Previously, and even now, I hear surgeons say, well, if they're on, uh, if they're immune suppressed, we need to operate early. And I call this good data gone bad or bad data gone bad. So there really are no prospective randomized trials looking at this situation. Um, the best we can do is look at rates of mortality in emergent colectomy in this patient group. And no surprise, if you're on immune suppressives and you undergo an emergent colectomy, you're more likely to die uh, than um, if you were not on immunosuppressive. But if you had an elective colectomy, your morbidity is, no surprise, higher if you're on immunosuppressives. And this is defined as steroids within 30 days for a chronic medical condition. In this study, 
And so it doesn't quite make sense to me to tell patients who feel fine, listen, you've had diverticulitis in the past, but now you're going to go on immunosuppressive, so you definitely need your colon out. We know that they are going to do worse uh, if you do a colectomy collectively or emergently. So that doesn't naturally lead you to offer surgery, in my opinion. Again, this is a nuanced discussion looking at all the variables. So what about staging systems? What the patient comes in, we have these fancy CAT scans. Can you predict their outcome long-term? The bottom line is not really. So the Hinchy classification uh, is okay. It falls down because it's just looking at people with abscesses and not all the other myriad ways diverticulitis can present. Amber Setti has had a, a big interest in diverticulitis, has a staging system, and you can see that um, this is how their group breaks it down, severe versus mild. And there is some evidence that if patients come in and have an abscess or extraluminal air pockets that are big, it does correlate with worse outcomes, it will appear. Remember that when I trained, we didn't have CAT scans uh, that were any good, and CAT scans took two or three hours to perform. So most patients didn't get CAT scans. So the patients with extraluminal air had to have it seen on a plain x-ray. I would guess in 20 years, if patients get their CAT scans fast enough, almost everyone will have free air because every case of diverticulitis is a perforation. So you can't look back more than five or 10 years and compare data when we talk about radiographic findings because the radiographic techniques are getting so much better. So in uh, Jason and Rocco's uh, data, we found that a family history of diverticulitis, a long segment and retroperitoneal abscess correlated with recurrence. And interestingly, if you had right-sided colonic diverticulitis, uh, that was associated with a lower rate of recurrence. Don't know exactly why. So who needs an elective colectomy? These people who come into your office who don't have a stricture or a symptomatic fistula. So prior to 2006, our practice glide guidelines were the two attacks over 50 and the one attack under 50. In 2006, that changed. People realized that the data did not support it. And ever since then, our society has said, make your own decision, talk to the patient. So that was an advance, but was not incredibly helpful for us in the office because every doctor is just sort of flying by the seat of their pants and the patients were too. So let's start just by defining what do we mean by quality of life limiting diverticulitis? That means the patient is not acutely in the emergency room, they're not dying, they don't have a fistula or stricture that is an obvious indication for surgery. They don't have free perforation and peritonitis. What they have is either intermittent recurrent disease or they have smoldering disease. So what's been published on this group? So really the only good trial published so far has been the direct trial, again, from Europe, prospective randomized in the Netherlands, either recurrent disease or smoldering, and they had about two thirds of their patients smoldering. And uh, they were offered medical management, basically observation or whatever drugs the patient wanted versus colectomy. And the nice thing about this trial is they asked the patients how they were doing rather than ask the doctor. Because when you ask us how our patients are doing, you might not get the honest truth. That's called observer bias. So, they administered to the patients what's called a GI quality of life index. And as I said, they had two thirds of their patients with smoldering disease. You know, these, the CAT scans don't get better. They got chronic tenderness, a mass. And what they found was despite a 15% anastomotic leak rate, which most of us would raise our eyebrows at, an 18% stoma rate, the quality of life, according to the patients, was better if they had surgery. So that really was the only thing out there. They had just uh, slightly over 100 patients, 109 in the final analysis. And everyone um, sort of raised their eyebrows at that and said, wow, uh, that supports surgery. But look at that leak rate and 
Uh, they had two thirds of their patients were smoldering, so we're not sure it applies to the most of the folks who walked into our office. The five-year follow-up for the direct trial, again, uh, the patients who had surgery fared better. So Dave Flum at the University of Washington uh, got some funding from the Patient-Centered Outcomes Research Institute and put together a prospective randomized trial called POSMIC, Comparison of Surgery and Medicine on the Impact of Diverticulitis. And I serve as the, the chair of the uh, clinical advisory group. I'm the local PI for the study. So I've been involved in this for five years. The name for COSMID was chosen just before COVID. And we were very much hoping that COVID would have been called coronavirus, but it wasn't. So recruitment was difficult during a pandemic in which people had lost uh, control over their health. And the names were very similar, which didn't help us. Nevertheless, we've been able to recruit uh, so far about 170 patients randomized and another 100 non-randomized. And the way it works is set up just like direct patients with quality of life limiting diverticulitis. We have tested them. We know they don't have cancer. And the people who would, and the surgeon has to have equipoise. It's the patient who comes into your office and you say, well, Mrs. Smith, you could have a colectomy and I'd be happy to do it if you want, or you could just do what you're doing now, which is not to have a colectomy and we can follow you along. And if the surgeon has equipoise, you can offer randomization. Now at that point, some people are willing to randomize and some people say, listen, I don't, I love science, but I want you to take my colon out. Or other people say, I love science, but you're not taking my colon out right now. And those patients we put in the observational group, which is now full with a hundred additional patients. When they randomize, and they randomize to medical management, we offer them a toolbox, which includes 5-ASA products, rifaximin, probiotics, whatever they want us to prescribe for them. So it's very pragmatic. We basically pattern it on what happens in normal practice. And again, we have a lot of outcome measures, but the principal outcome variable is the GI quality of life index, and that allows us to compare our results with the direct trial. So if you're in an institution that is enrolling in COSMED, I encourage you to go to clinic and support randomization, help out. We'd love to get to 250 patients and close it. We'd like to get a COSMED score that could help us in the future. Imagine if you were sitting there with your patient and they'd had a few attacks and they said, well, do you think I need surgery, doc? And you could plug everything into the computer just like you do with other websites, looking at mortality and what have you and you'd get the COSMID score back. And if the COSMID score was less than a certain number, you're better off not operating. If it's greater than a certain number, better off operating. Wouldn't that be wonderful? Because up till now, we've been flying by the seat of our pain. Well, I'd like to finish up by talking about a little complicated disease. And complicated is really a bad uh, wastebasket for two different classes of problems. So the first is what I call annoying complicated, fistula stricture or abscess, and then the other group are the life-threatening, the ruptured abscess, which is the most common peritonitis uh, situation in diverticulitis, and then true fecal peritonitis, which is much more rare. So fistulas, um, if the patient is healthy, it's reasonable to rule out cancer and operate. They're not going to get better on their own. Uh, unfortunately, a lot of these patients are sent to the end organ doctor first, the urologist, gynecologist, et cetera, uh, but they really just need to see us and get sorted out. For a stricture, uh, it's sometimes tough to ex exclude cancer, um, and you have to make uh, decisions uh, based on the best you can do with a small scope or CT calligraphy. But in general, if they're symptomatic, it's not going to get better. And usually balloon dilatation doesn't work so well. And putting in stents is a bad idea because the stent will erode through the colon wall and cause havoc within nine to 15 months or so. So most of these patients, again, need a collective. So now on to abscess, which is a funny thing. A lot of folks get abscess more now than before. Again, this is because our CAT scans are better. We can see them. And um, in the past, anyone who came in with an abscess, uh, whether it was percutaneously drained or operatively drained, was ultimately offered a collectomy. And then along the way, we had some people who were poor surgical risk and they'd have their abscesses drained. 
And then the surgeon said, geez, I really don't think you're going to do well with operation. And it didn't operate on them. And then there were a bunch of non-randomized studies, observational studies, small numbers um, published, basically saying that a lot of these patients did fine without surgery. And that got people to think about it. And so practice has often changed a bit uh, based on that. Um, not hard science, but a general acknowledgement that not everyone needs a colectomy necessarily if they've had an abscess drain. And in fact, in the COSMID trial, you can enroll a patient who's had an abscess, had it drained, and it is resolved. Well, what about peritonitis? So this is Brock Lesnar. For those of you who don't know him, uh, he is an MMA fighter, and he had bad diverticulitis. And for those of you who hadn't uh, read his um, autobiography uh, that was ghostwritten by a guy named Paul Heyman called Death Watch. Uh, Brock Lesnar, who makes a living trying to beat up other humans in the ring and get beaten up, said, it felt like I had taken a shotgun blast to the stomach. Then someone poured in some salt and Tabasco and stirred it all up with a nasty pitchfork. So diverticulitis, when it perforates can, and you have peritonitis, can cause a lot of symptoms. So the question is, in patients who have evidence of diverticulitis with some free air, does that necessarily mean they should be rushed off to the operating room? So there are certainly patients who weren't that, but as opposed to the dogma of old, not everyone needs to do that. So just having free air on a CAT scan does, should not rush you to the operating room. As I said, everyone's gonna have free air on CAT scans once our CAT scan gets very good and you can have a little portable CAT scan around your iPhone and do it at home. So th this is an observational study from my former partners at WashU who took folks who had free air with diverticulitis and that's their algorithm there, but a bunch of them were not operated on. And it turned out that very few required emergency operation. And when I was at Wash U, it real, that sort of practice was common and it pushed me to think about it. And I have changed my practice a lot to try to convert these emergent situations into elective situations later, because I think the patients uh, do better. You can see there, I've circled in red the number and percent of patients in each group undergoing uh, urgent operation, and it is very modest. So that strategy works for most folks. Antibiotics, NPO, TPN if they need it, something to think about. Well, what about laparoscopic lavage? I don't know if any of you are in institutions that do this. Uh, a lot of the data came from Western Australia and Ireland, interestingly enough, and a lot of the people writing these papers and talking about it would get up at on podiums and say, we don't have access, ready access to good interventional radiology. So I wonder a bit whether the patients entered into these trials of laparoscopic lavage would have been patients we would just percutaneously drain, put on antibiotics and wait it out. Uh, but nevertheless, there were a couple of randomized trials, the Scandiv and the uh, ladies trial. Um, and laparoscopic lavage, which was in vogue uh, for a bit, um, has sort of fallen out of vogue uh, in many places because uh, the primary outcomes uh, were either not different or higher in the lavage group, and these were adverse outcomes. Um, this is a, another trial um, of lap lavage versus Hartman. You know, I think there's not a lot of hard data on laparoscopic lavage, but it doesn't seem to be a technique that I think um, should be widely employed. I think medical treatment and percutaneous drainage of abscess can get you a long way without having to rinse out the belly, but maybe there's some patients who would benefit. I'll finish up with just a couple of tips and tricks. If you have to do an emergent Hartman resection, as someone who's been sent disaster patients who've undergone Hartman resections in the past, I would urge you to consider the following. If you do a Hartman resection, the philosophy should be only take out what you need to take out to get out the area of perforation and get the patient off the table. Do not do huge mobilizations of the splenic flexure or anything else if you don't have to. Sometimes you have to to get a good colostomy up to the skin, but if you don't have to, leave it alone. Why? 
because you're going to go back three, six, nine, 12 months later and have to redo that mobilization. And mobilizing it the first time doesn't mean it stays mobilized. It immediately falls back and sticks. Secondly, I know by this time in the year, all of you have done difficult Hartman reversals where the rectosigmoid stump or the rectal stump has coiled back into the deep into the pelvis, covered by the bladder, the ureter is medialized, and it's a bear trying to get that out. So if you're doing the original Hartman, leave a little distal sigmoid if you can, bring it up as high as you can into the abdomen and tack it to the undersurface of the abdominal wall to keep that rectosigmoid straight. So you bring it up, you sew it in, I just use vitrals and I try to tack it up just underneath my stone. What this means is that when you go back to operate, there's the other pelvic structures have not fallen and covered it. It's not a difficult pelvic dissection because other than getting a small bowel out, you don't have to do any. All you have to do is mobilize your rectosigmoid, resect the rect of your stick, rest of your sigmoid colon, and do your anastomosis to a beautiful, fresh piece of proximal rectum. And so I encourage you to tell your friends about this. Uh, this uh, has helped me more than anything else uh, in doing Hartman reversing. So a brief review of what we've talked about, data versus dogma. Does CT make the diagnosis? Nope, you gotta consider the other things. It's not nuts and seeds. It's just a hole in the colon at the side of a diverticulum. Antibiotics for uncomplicated disease without systemic signs of illness, uh, not necessary based on good prospective randomized trial. Who needs a colectomy? The natural history would tell you that uh, the rate of re recurrent complicated disease with perforation, Hartman resection is really low. So it is an individualized discussion. We're trying to figure out how to guide people by doing this prospective randomized trial. Please recruit for COSMID. And our staging systems currently are not very helpful. Um, so hopefully this has been helpful. I would end with what I almost always end. The more you know about something, the less sure you are of anything. I've studied several things in my career a lot, diverticulitis being one of them. And the more I study these things, the less sure I am of anything. And much of what you are taught or what you believe now will ultimately be proven wrong. So please always remember that in the future, it is your critical thinking skills that will benefit your patients more than anything you've been taught in the past. So I love dogs, but I hate dogma. And hopefully I've uh, prompted you to think a little bit and think critically about your patients with diverticulitis, because if you're going to be a colorectal surgeon, you're going to see them. Thank you so much for the opportunity to speak with you tonight. Awesome. Thank you, Dr. Reed, for this uh, awesome talk. Um, we do have a couple questions, if that's okay. Sure. Um, and they're sort of uh, about a couple different things. So one question we got was about the use of a dietary fiber supplement, not in treatment or after a first attack, but in terms of preventing um, diverticulitis. Yeah, not as, as I said, not a lot of data to support that. Uh, what do I tell my patients? I tell them, I don't know. I use that a lot in clinic. They ask me things, I just say, I don't know. You've got to obviously expand on that. I tell them the data are not crystal clear. Uh, we think it's a hole in your we know it's a hole in your colon at the side of a diverticulum. What causes that hole? We don't know. Could it be a pressure phenomenon? Sure. Seems like a good hydrodynamic principle. And um, if you reduce the pressure in your colon, maybe that would help. But again, no data. So I tell patients, if you want to use fiber and you think you feel better and you defecate better on fiber, go ahead and use it. It's not going to hurt you. Great. Um, the next question I have is about diet advancement in patients who you're treating non-operatively um, with free air. Um, so, you know, microperforated patients um, that are being managed non-operatively. What's, what is your philosophy about the speed of diet advancement? Do you advance right away to clear liquids? Do you wait? Do you send them home still on clears? Um, Sure. Great question. Again, no data on this. So when people tell you they got to be on clear liquids for exactly eight to 10 days, you know, or 13 to 12 to 15 days or whatever it is, and they got to do this exactly, it, it, they're just making it up. So you can make it up. How do I make it up? It, there are some patients who come in who are really sick. Let's say they got a pretty big perf and I'm hovering over them and they're marked for stomacytes 
maybe I don't let them put that much in their mouth of anything. Uh, but the average patient who just gets admitted with an inflammation of the colon, I give them liquids uh, right off the bat and let them drink Ensure because the amount of poop that makes should be minimal. And all I'm thinking of is the amount of stool in the sewer pipe going by the hole. That's it. And the amount of work my colon has to do to process it versus the work it's got to do to repair itself. But again, no data. So as they get better, I tell them, do whatever you want. And I sort of explain the pathophysiology as we understand it. And I tell them they can nourish themselves completely with nutritional supplements that have fat, carbohydrate, and protein. And they don't necessarily need to eat something. And maybe being on a low residue diet might reduce the amount of poop you make and might help, but I'm making it up. I freely admit that. Do you, you mentioned uh, recommending colonoscopy for those who hadn't had a recent one um, post-diverticulitis episode. How long do you recommend people wait after resolution of their symptoms or in the case of smoldering diverticulitis when they don't ever really resolve? So if they're completely resolved and they're asymptomatic, it's probably okay to do the colonoscopy. You know, we used to tell patients three months, and then I think the Cleveland Clinic Florida group published a paper, this has got to be 20 years ago now, showing that six weeks was fine. Um, you know, obviously there's a risk of stirring things up with your scope or with uh, CO2 insufflation. Um, and I think if there's a very low uh, concern for cancer, you can put that off for a while. How much is a while? Three months, six months? You know, if they had a colonoscopy three and a half years ago, and there's no personal family history of colorectal cancer, do they even need a colonoscopy? I don't know, but that's someone you can kick down the road if they're completely asymptomatic. Someone who's got a family history of Lynch syndrome and has been labeled as smoldering diverticulitis, I'd have the scope in that patient sooner rather than later, if it's gonna change what I do um, in the operating room. If it's not gonna change what you do, if you know you're gonna operate, you just operate and under and then try to gently do a colonoscopy intraoperatively. So if you worsen the perforation, you're just gonna we'll be right there and take it out anyway. And then as far as causing perforations, I don't know of a lot of hard data, you know, big longitudinal studies of people being admitted for worsening air outside the colon, et cetera. What do I do? I use a pediatric colonoscope. We use CO2 for insufflation. I try to be gentle and I don't push it. I'm really, really the key thing is just to take a peek up beyond the sigmoid. If that's wherever your diverticulitis was, you just want to peek through that area and make sure there's not cancer or chrome. And that was my next question. So you read our mind there um, about perforations in that setting. Um, next, what is the trend right now at your institution at the University of Florida in terms of managing not uncomplicated diverticulitis? Are people giving antibiotics or no, or just all over the place depends? Uh, it is all over the place. Uh, since I've been here and pushing COSMID and doing some talks with the GI and primary care, I have run into some patients in my clinic who said, my PCP told me I didn't need antibiotics. I will tell you that's rare. Because in America, we're a do something society, right? At the end of my life, you don't gather my grandkids around and sing songs and celebrate my life and have a party. What you do, I'll be in the ICU getting chemo and you know all the, all the things, right? We're a do something society. So people are stunned when I tell them I'm not, you don't need antibiotics and they argue with me. If they argue too long, I just give up and give it to them. Mentioning cultural differences, um, can you comment about diverticulitis and its relationship to the Western diet versus diets and dietary habits in other countries? Yeah, if you go all the way back to Burkett and way back in the day, um, you know, I think there's been a lot of editorial pieces written about that. But if you think about it critically, you know, I encourage all my trainees to, when people come up with questions or they make grand statements, they should ask, how does she know that? And you lock yourself in a room and you design the study that would definitively answer the question or test the hypothesis. With the design of the study, you've got to do a power calculation, figure out your outcome variables, your inclusion criteria, et cetera. And you quickly realize that most of these things that are said as gospel are not based on anything. Because once you've designed that theoretic study, you go to the literature and look for it. And fiber and diet is one of those things. Because diets are a funny thing. It's really hard to track what people eat. 
So I will not make any grand pronouncements about diets in other parts of the world. Certainly there are dif differences in rates of diverticulitis, but is that differences in diagnosis? Um, is there bias because people in other countries that are, have fewer resources don't ever come to the hospital? So nothing gets coded unless they're really, really sick. Do they not live that long to get diverticulitis because they have other infectious diseases, malaria, et cetera, that take their life early? Uh, you know what I mean? So it's very hard to answer that definitively. Um, and one last question for you here. Um, is there, you talked about Hartman's in the setting of acute perforated diverticulitis in a, a sick patient. Is there, is there any circumstance in which you would primarily re-anastomose a patient who you were acutely operating on for diverticulitis and do a diverting loop ileostomy instead, just because we know that's easier to take down. Sure, I'll address that. So one thing, I, I never use the term perforated diverticulitis because every case of diverticulitis is perforated. It's just a matter of degree. Um, so what you're talking about is the patient who's acutely ill. So the problem with analyzing those data are, again, there is so much bias in who gets taken to the operating room. I showed you those Wash U data, and they had people with free air under the diaphragm and everything, and they managed them non-operatively, and most of them did just fine. So there are a lot of patients in my practice where if it wasn't me or one of my partners, they'd be getting their resection. So the people we operate on emergently have got to be really, really sick because we've got a big experience taking everyone else through a non-operative pathway that a lot of surgeons wouldn't do. It's always easier to have your patient post-op, right? It's a lot simpler than hovering over them, wondering. Um, and so there are a lot of problems in the data. Secondly, if you're going to operate uh, urgently and do a primary anastomosis and you don't do a proximal colonic lavage, you might as well skip the loop ileostomy because now you've got this whole column of stool from your anastomosis all the way back to your sequence. And doing a loop ileostomy just minimizes the new poop that goes by them, right? But you've got that whole column of stool that can go by. I mean, we can argue about pressure and everything else, but if you're gonna do that, you should probably consider doing an intraoperative colonic lavage. It's really the only time it's indicated is when you're gonna do an anastomosis with a proximal diverting loop ileostomy. If you're not gonna do the proximal diverting loop ileostomy, there's no reason to do the colonic lavage because stool is good for the colonocyte. Poop is healthy. So if you don't think their anastomosis is just going to break down, skip the ileostomy. So again, we do things that are kind of funny. Awesome. But the, so my five rules of deciding to do an anastomosis are the following. Maybe this will help someone somewhere. I look at five conditions and one um, critical thinking. So I look at the condition of the intestine. So if, if you have bad diverticulitis and your descending colon looks edematous and horrible and nasty, it's probably not a smart idea to sew it together. I look at the condition of the abdomen. If you've got that fecal peritonitis burn on your colon uh, and rectum that you're going to sew together, you should think twice. You got to look at the acute condition of the patient. So if they're on four pressors and the anesthesiologist is performing CPR, probably not the time for your primary anastomosis. Then you look at the chronic condition of the patient, immunosuppressives, cardiopulmonary disease, frailty index, all that stuff. And then the last one is should you. Um, for diverticulitis, there's not much of a should you other than if the patient's dying from something else, like they're undergoing palliative chemotherapy for metastatic lung cancer and they have three months to live, just do the heart intercession. Why put them at increased risk? They just want to spend time with their family. Just get them off the table, let them eat, let them move on. And always remember that a loop ileostomy is not a great thing to give anyone, and especially for patients who are older who are going to have more fluid loss and can't replace it. So that's kind of how I think about that situation. Awesome. Well, on that note, we will wrap it up for tonight. Thank you again, Dr. Reed, for taking the time to speak with us. This was hugely helpful and informative, um, and we really appreciate it. Um, and for everybody out there, please uh, check us out at our website, crsvirtualeducation.org, um, and be sure to tune in next Sunday. Uh, we'll uh, see you all later. Thank you. Thanks so much. Appreciate it. You guys have chosen a great specialty. Colorectal is awesome. Sign up for the society so you can get the uh, ASCRSU benefits. Will do. All right. <laughs> see ya. Good luck.